Good morning. My name is uh, Rusty Hoffman. Uh, I'm professor in chief of radiology, interventional radiology here at Stanford, uh, but started a company called uh, Grand Rounds uh, a few years ago, about six years ago. And the reason I started the company as I've been, I've been fortunate to really practice at preeminent institutions throughout my career. I spent 10 years at Johns Hopkins, and I've been here at Stanford now for 12 years. And I became incredibly frustrated as a physician watching how my patients would suffer because they got poor care someplace else. They did not receive state-of-the-art care. Some of these people actually had been suffering for two decades before they found me, I did a procedure on them in an hour and a half and transformed their lives and they were no longer disabled and able to walk and play golf again. Then I had the experience, the unfortunate experience of my youngest son, Grady. He became critically ill for over two years. He required a bone marrow transplant and it was the worst experience that any parent could ever ask for. The good news is it had a happy ending. Grady is a freshman in high school, has a girlfriend actually going on a date tonight, and um, takes after his father, I like to say, <laughs> and, um, and is you know, going to be surfing with me this weekend. But, oh, thank you. But that experience as a father to Grady and that experience as the leader of the household and explain to my wife and my two other sons what was going on over this two and a half year journey, it gave me really a profound sense of what it was like to be a patient and how I was able to navigate the system. And it was really because I'm privileged. I'm a professor at Stanford. I can call anyone in this country at any institution, at any level, and they will call me back same day. And so it was with those connections that helped me navigate the multiple complications Grady had throughout his care, but it's really a, a testament to the, to the stem, cell care, stem cell transplant team here at Stanford that saved my son's life. And what I really wanted to be able to do was I need to figure out a way to make exceptional care every day accessible to everyone, not just sons of chiefs of interventional radiology at Stanford. So, you know, we got, I got teed up actually pretty nicely by Robbie uh, Pearl this morning, and then, you know, Sally Wellborn mentioned uh, Grand Rounds, but I wanna kind of tell you what, how we've kind of evolved as a company to really solve what I found is a profound problem in healthcare. So let's just pick one surgery, spinal surgeries, $40 billion a year, $40 billion on one surgery. That's a third of what we spend on education. That's also what we're estimating it's gonna take to clean up Florida after Irma, one surgery. The problem is many of those surgeries are unnecessary. The patient actually just needs physical therapy, a thoughtful physician to listen to the problems the patient's having, having and help try and cope through the pain till the body will heal itself. So through our book of business, we actually estimate if these patients, all these spinal surgery patients that actually come through Grand Rounds and learn the alternatives of what could be possible for them besides surgery, we would save the healthcare system $24 billion on one surgical procedure. So, I'm a proceduralist. I do minimally invasive surgeries. I stent things, I fix aortas, I stop people from bleeding. It's a, it's a great job and it's very gratifying. But what I tell my family and I tell my friends, you can't have a surgical complication if you don't have surgery. So I think that's how I became professor at Stanford with that wisdom. And, um, and so every time I put a patient on the table, I'm doing a risk benefit analysis of is this actually, the risk that I'm incurring to this patient actually gonna be worth the possible benefit. And complications cause a multitude of downstream expense to the employer or, or to the government but also impairs the quality of life for the patient. 
Perhaps the most disturbing thing you're going to hear from me today is when we look at our book of business, when we provide uh, expert opinion to our patients, your employees, we see a major change in diagnosis and treatment 66% of the time. Now, when I started the company, the CEO at the time, who's the early investor, like his head exploded because this was after we had done like 60 cases, we saw this. At 100 cases, we saw this. It's like, this is crazy. I'm like, guess what, Michael? This is what I've seen my entire career. Almost two out of every three patients I come in contact with, I believe, has gotten poor care because there's been a wrong decision or diagnosis or drug or surgery prescribed during the course of their care. And the problem is that's expensive. So the thesis at Grand Rounds, and what's kind of actually some of the talk that was earlier this morning, is that I believe all healthcare starts with the doctor-patient relationship. No matter what we bolt on around this really sacrosanct relationship, between a doctor and a patient, it's not gonna matter if we don't get that relationship correct. And the reason we're kind of in the predicament we are today is that the way we deliver care is a legacy system. It's based on the way we delivered care in 1930. So if I was a doctor in 1930 and Kristen got sick, she would hop in her car and come down to my little office and I would listen to her heart and I would look in her ears and I would look in her eyes and I would take out a piece of paper and I'd write it down and put it in a file and stick it in a cabinet. Now, how do we, like, what tools do I have now today? Well, I have genetic testing, I have CAT scans, I have MRIs, I have ultrasound. I still have to listen to the patient. That's incredibly important and I'd argue it's the most important thing but there's a much, much more efficient way to deliver care than the way we did it in 1930, and we're still doing it the same way. But back to the sacrosanct bond between a patient and a physician. I believe, and people at Grand Rounds believe, that by matching the right patient to the right doctor that's high quality in terms of their medical acumen, but is able to really understand the patient's needs and their preferences, that we can make a meaningful impact on care, its outcome, and cost. And by doing this, by listening to patients, by helping doctors actually deliver the care and the way that we fuse the connection between them, it's our goal in the next five years to actually impact one third of households in America. So how are we doing it? What have we built? So we've built a marketplace that really connects patients to the world's best physicians. And the world's best physicians don't have to be at Harvard or Stanford or UCSF. They can be what I believe was my father, a pediatrician in a steel town in Ohio, Canton, Ohio. That guy was an amazing clinician because he listened to the patient. He was, he was so compassionate. And there's a saying from Sir William Osler, who was the person that founded Johns Hopkins. You listen to the patient long enough, they'll tell you the diagnosis. So, and so many of us forget it, and I forget it, I'm sure, numerous times a day. But what we have built is this technology platform to be able to deliver our care in the 21st century with these new tools that we have at our disposals. Our core IP is around this quality algorithm. How do we know a doctor is good? We have a quality score on 96% of doctors in America that's internal facing that helps us recommend who we're gonna send a patient to, and I'll talk about that shortly. We integrate into the benefits that the employers provide. So if a patient calls in and says, I'm a 39-year-old woman and I'm having trouble get pregnant, pregnant, we can look up on the screen like, wow, you actually have a fertility benefit. We're gonna route you there. Or, oh, you have a rash, uh, you have doctor on demand, we're gonna send you there. Or if you have a rash and you don't have doctor on demand, we have doctors here at Grand Rounds that can actually answer your questions, talk to you, and look at you through video chat. In all of this is, is 
is run by a physician-led care team. It's my belief, Owen's belief, my co-founder and CEO, is that you really need that broad-based training and education as a physician to be able to deliver the care at this scale and in this way. Now, I figured out how long I was in education, you know, how long I went to school, and then including my residency. Like, it's 26 years. I mean, it was, you know, it's a lot of fun. It was a lot of work. Uh, but subsequently, you know, when anyone that knows me uh, on the planet, they get sick, no matter where they are in the world, guess who they call? <laughs> Dr. Rusty. <laughs> and it's, at a time, it's overwhelming because of the profound responsibility, I feel like. What? They're consenting you to put a pacemaker in you? And where are you? Texas? What? Like, how many times has this happened to you before? This is my first time. No, you don't need a pacemaker. Get back here. I'll find you an electrophysiologist here at Stanford or PAMP where we can get you evaluated. True story. So let me just tell you about how we have evolved as a company. Many of us, know, many of people in the employer space know Grand Rounds for our expert opinions. That's where we kind of started. We get all the medical records, we get all the imaging, we package it up nicely, we send it to Dr. Famous somewhere across the country. They write up an opinion directed to the patient. Our, our staff physicians call the patient, review the opinion to make sure they understand it, much like I did when I was trying to explain to my wife what a bone marrow transplant is and what B cells and T cells are. So the patient has a profound understanding of what's going on with them. Because I believe an educated patient is an engaged and empowered patient, and they will make the right decision for them once they have enough information. The problem is now patients don't get enough information and they get it in the oral tradition and they forget 50% of it, just like I would. So giving them a written document about what's going on and what their options are so they can share it with their family members is a profound uh, empowerment move to help the patient decide. Well, as I told you earlier, two thirds of the time we're like, hey, we're not really sure about your, we don't agree with the diagnosis of the treatment. Some of the, doc, some of the patients would take it back to their doctors and they would open up the opinion. It's got a picture of Dr. Famous and they're like, how did you get Dr. Famous to look at your stuff? I don't know what's in here, but I guarantee you I'll agree with it. Again, again exact words from what I was told by a patient when she showed it to her doctor regarding back surgery. So we have patients that do that, but some of them want new patients, new doctors. So we started our visits program, and this is where we developed a way and a perspective to look at all the practicing physicians in America to decide, okay, you need an OBGYN in Topeka, Kansas. You need a breast surgeon in Atlanta, Georgia, and how we were able to do this at scale and send patients to high quality physicians. We then went up another click with Grand Rounds Beacon, where we provided in how you could, it's like phone a friend, it's called Grand Round Stat. You're in the hospital, they're like, well, they told me I need my gallbladder out. I'm not really sure what a gallbladder does. So you can call in, you can talk to a physician, they can explain, they can talk about, hopefully they're doing laparoscope and not the big whack that Steve was talking about. So, and if they say the big whack, like, hey, we're gonna find you a different doctor. Um, and so that type of support that we provided for patients. And then what happened with some of our employer partners who are like, wow, the people that use your stuff, they really like it and they seem like they're doing well. Let's, let's get more people to use it. And so they started requiring for certain surgeries where the patients would have to get an expert opinion. It didn't mean they had to follow it. They just had to get one. And so that was the way that there was a bit of a utilization of boost in those specific populations. And then towards the end of the con uh, my talk, I'll tell you about where we are today and where we're going. So really, again, at this core is this doctor-patient relationship. And what we needed to do is figure out who we believe are great doctors clinically and technically. So we have amassed over seven billion pieces of data on practicing physicians in America to provide a quality score of whether they're from zero to 99 is actually the score, but we bucket them in low, medium, and high. And we believe that 
this is our best way, and it's, you know, we've been doing this now for three or four years, to send patients at the very outset of their disease to go see an orthopedic surgeon that when they say they have knee pain, says, let's just do physical therapy, not, physical th not a scope in physical therapy, just like Robbie talked about in the beginning of his uh, discussion. But when we really think about who's the right doctor, when someone calls me and says, hey, I need a cardiologist, or hey, I need an internal medicine doctor, I mean, I, I know these people, I, kinda, I know their socioeconomic status, I know their educational level, I know their support system, I know if they have a car, I can think of all these things when I'm trying to, I know where they live, I can tell them who's a good doctor for them locally. So how do you do that at scale? So the first and foremost is we gotta make sure they're actually a good doctor, that they're a high quality physician and that they score in the upper decile of our quality score. The next thing, which is mind boggling to me as a physician is, although it makes sense, it's like patients don't like to drive very far depending on where you live. So San Francisco, Boston, people like, if it's longer than three miles, it might as well be 300 miles. But if you live in Jacksonville or you live in Pittsburgh, yeah, 20, 30 miles, no problem. I mean, if you live in Turlock, they drive 300 miles all the time. So they come, I see, I see a lot of them here at Stanford. So distance actually is a really important thing and it's part of our algorithm. Our, we call it our distance blending algorithm and, it, and because we take into account the severity of disease when we decide how far we recommend a patient to, to drive. The other question is, will the patient and doctor form a connection? So what are, the, what are the unique requirements of the patient that the doctor has? What language does the doctor speak? What ethnicity is the doctor? What gender? I mean, things like that so that we can optimize for a relationship. Now, I talked to you a little bit about how we look at distance. And one thing is, when things are bad, we tell people you gotta drive. And so Whipple procedure is probably the most complex procedure in medicine. Uh, if it's in good hands, good hands, 30% complication rate. We also know every, stu every study shows the more volume a surgeon has, the better they are technically, the lower their complication rate. The Whipple procedure is typically for patients with pancreatic cancer. You remove half the pancreas, you remove the gallbladder, and then you have to hook up the pancreas back to the small intestine, and, and you also remove a good chunk of the small intestine. But then you have to hook everything up. So pancreas to small intestine, small intestine to the liver, stomach to small intestine, and then you're done. And it's about a three or four hour procedure. When we looked at our data, 44% of the patients that had a Whipple procedure went to a practitioner that did less than five a year. At Stanford, we do five a week. This is crazy. And the sad part is 93% of them live just 50 miles from a doctor that had a higher volume. So these are simple things with data, with information that we can help patients get to the right place. So here is actually a map of the United States as evaluated by Grand Rounds for orthopedic surgery in any um, MSA that has at least three orthopedic surgeons. And you can see the red dots to the green dots. The problem is the orange and yellows cover all the other green dots because there are just so many kind of what we consider mediocre physicians. That's the middle of the bell curve, right? The bell curve, and so that's kind of covering everything. What we need to do and what we do at Grand Rounds is find the green dots. These, they're all there. You just need to know where they are. Sometimes they're literally sharing a wall with the doctor that's an orange dot. And so with orthopedic surgeons, when we analyze the outcomes of the orthopedic surgeons against the quality algorithm that we've developed, it's, again, I've told you it's been three to four years in the making, seven billion pieces of data. These, these doctors have 15% lower hospital readmission rates, 20 to 25% lower complication rates, 30 to 40% lower mortality rates. Mortality, that's a big one and 10 to 30% lower cost per patient, all right? Hey, like if any of you guys go to Vegas, I mean, you're already playing at least the best 49%, you know, versus 51%. This is your life. This is what's gonna be the difference between using a cane and not using a cane. 
So when we go into this uh, talk to employers, um, depending on the size of the account, we will actually, if they will let us, we will ingest their claims data for the past three years and tell them where their patients are being seen by doctors that we don't think are good. And so you can see across the specialties, red not being good, green being good, and yellow and orange being in the middle. And what we really focus on initially as we're getting ramped up is how do we get the red to the green? And so that is the lowest hanging fruit because the data, when you look at these, the, the physicians that are in red is actually really concerning. And it's people that you do not want to go so, see. And so Robbie talked about this earlier and this is an information thing and this is a big data play. And by amassing this data, we're able to very confidently say who we believe are high quality physicians. So let me show you like, so we have our quality algorithm. Let me show you how it ranks up against published data and outcomes that we are able to get access to. So low quality primary care physicians prescribe Xanax 150% more often than high quality physicians. I have a whole thing on the opiate thing, which will, would make your head explode. Um, that actually Grand Rounds had identified this issue about a year and a half ago before it all hit the, the lay press. Um, cardiac stress testing. Low quality cardiologists administer stress tests 75% more often. We also have data showing high quality doctors, cardiologists adopt new blood thinners and new antiplatelets sooner than low quality. Top oncologists administer genetic testing 200% more often than low quality. And then what about kind of the simple stuff? Preventative medicine, vaccines. Well, top PCPs administer preventative measures and vaccines 50% of the time more than the low quality. So again, this is all focused on the doctor-patient relationship and trying to get that match right. But what we have found is that the, the patients and the employers have been so, they've been happy with what we're doing. Like, hey, can you help us with this? Can you help us with this? Can you help us with this? And so we started just getting overwhelmed with all the different requests. And so we've actually decided that we're, we're launching a new product and it's called Grand Round Summit. And so Grand Round Summit, you can actually think about it like Dr. Rusty at scale. <laughs> It's, it's the front door to your medical journey. You can call us for anything related to healthcare, whether it's related to the rash, prescription, side effect, cancer, or the copay, or benefits and claim advocacy. So let me talk a little bit about it. So we talked about the comprehensive solution. We have expert opinions for high cost claimants. We have um, the visits to help you find a local doc doctor quickly. We have um, the uh, talk to a doc with the virtual video conferencing. We also then have the ability to the match the members, as I said, with our visits program to high quality doctors, but then overlaying cost so that we can now integrate cost transparency into the decision for the patient and the staff physician that's helping making the decision. I didn't have time to talk about our access partnerships, but we have contracted partnerships with dozens of the top medical institutions in this country so that when we need to send somebody to Dana-Farber, we don't call 1-800-Dana-Farber. We call a specific person, Sally, and she picks up the phone and says, okay, this, you, you want to see Dr. Who? Great. I'll get into his calendar and we'll put that patient on for you. We integrate with other uh, with on-site clinics as well as other benefits that you have purchased. And we also do the advocacy piece uh, for, the, uh, for the member or we refer to them as patient at Grand Rounds. And really to, to maximize the engagement, we are replacing the carrier directory, which is the worst piece of software that I think has been written in healthcare. And second then is Epic. Um, so. <laughs> Epic's a four-letter word for a reason. Um, 
And, uh, and then we also will be the number on the back of the card so the patient can call us at any time. So just want to thank the people that trust us to take care of their patients. We have over 3 million members uh, that we take care of. These are some of the partners uh, th across the country uh, that work with us very, very closely, as well as the team at Grand Rounds that does the hard work. Over 300 employees there, over 60 clinicians and data scientists working together to really provide that compassionate care that the patients deserve and they need. Thank you.